Well, you're very welcome to this talk. It's Thursday the 8th of July. Now, I'm just going to start off with a bit of an orientation slide, as we often do here. Now, this is um, new daily confirmed COVID-19 cases per million, as we look at. So, in Australia, we're getting a few cases, no question about that. Mostly in the New South Wales area, probably more on that uh, shortly. Uh, New Zealand low, of course. Canada going down. United States is starting to go up. Now, I've got some data from the United States here as regards the Delta variant. Now, at the moment, overall in the United States, it's gone up to 51.6% is now the Delta variant. So more than half of the cases in the United States are now Delta. And in certain states, it's over 80%. Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, Iowa. 80.7%. Now, this high prevalence of Delta cases, if the UK is anything to go by, it means there's going to be a period of rapid growth of cases in the United States. I don't think there's any real question about that. That is what this variant does. So there we have the United States. That will be going up. Ireland already going up relatively low vaccination rates compared to the UK. Um, Delta variant starting to spread there and I'm afraid we probably are going to see this exponential growth in Ireland as well. South Africa going into winter, low vaccination rate, Delta variant cases going up and of course the UK we know about only too well. So I think there's some interesting things for the, uh, for the future there of the United States and other countries with the, uh, the, the Delta variant. Now, um, let's look at some of this Zoe data here. Um, that, that's, the, that's the reference for the Zoe COVID symptom tracker site. And, and, and here we have the graphic, and really it's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? This is what the B117 alpha variant did. This is what the Delta variant is doing, and this is what the Delta variant will do in terms of number of new cases. That is uh, by far the most likely scenario. Hopefully not transposing into hospitalizations and deaths. There will be some increase, but not a great increase. Now, Tim Spector gives data on his, um, from, from the COVID symptom tracker app data. Unvaccinated people, the positivity rate is 5.25%. One dose of vaccine, the positivity rate goes down to 3.2% of those tested. And fully vaccinated, it goes down to 0.99%. So that is looking good in terms of vaccine protection from that way of looking at the data with the unvaccinated having much higher positivity rates. And we know that two doses of the vaccine are needed to get good protection against the Delta variant. Now, one thing that I wasn't too happy to hear from uh, Tim Spector uh, is, is predicting there's going to be low levels of covid for a long time. So we're talking many seasons here potentially. Now I'd originally hoped for three or four seasons of COVID, it could end up being longer than that. I'm hoping it's not going to be five, six or seven, but that, that's Tim Spector's words and he's got all the data at his fingertips, low levels for a long time. Now Tim Spector is very worried, as am I, about the increase in cases and how this will feed through into long COVID. Now, we know that long COVID is not necessarily related to the severity of the initial infection. And this is what is a concern. And uh, Tim Spector, being a quantitative man, gives uh, data on this. So people in their 20s, 1.2% of them get long COVID. Middle-aged people, 4.7% of those testing positive get long COVID. Now, Long COVID is defined in different ways. Tim Spector's team define it as um, inability to return to normal duties after 12 weeks. But of course, we know that a lot of cases last for longer than that. So using that definition of 12 weeks, still not being able to do everything that people would normally do. Um, that is the sort of um, percentages we're looking at. Uh, the proportions are lower than in the second wave, presumably... He didn't say that, presumably protected by the vaccination. Now, of those unvaccinated at the moment, who are currently unvaccinated, who are the ones that are mostly getting the new infections at the moment, one in 80 are probably going to go on and get long COVID. Now, that is 
quite a lot. One, one in 80, I'm probably going to go on and get the infection and get long COVID. So pretty high numbers. Now, he says that currently with the cases we've got today, uh, 500 people a day are developing. We're, we're basically, 500 people a day are getting infected now will still be symptomatic and have their lifestyles impaired in three months time. How much long after that, the longer after that, this data doesn't show, but a proportion we know go on to a year or more. So 500 people a day developing or will go on to develop long COVID at the moment. Of people that are, uh, so currently 500 people per day that are unvaccinated plus 200 that have been vaccinated. So that actually makes 700 a day. Now, as cases go up, of course, this is going to go up as well. So 50,000 cases per day would result in long co in uh, a thousand cases of long COVID per day. I should say in in a thousand cases of long COVID per day. So by the 19th of July, when we have this so-called expression I find a bit ludicrous, Freedom Day, when all restrictions are going to be changed in England from being mandatory to being based on our common sense. Uh, Scotland is looking like it's going to carry on with compulsory restrictions, by the way. But England is going to have this so-called Freedom Day, 19th of July. By that time, there's probably going to be 50,000 new cases per day. That means a 1,000 people are getting infected per day on the 19th and the 20th and the 21st and the 22nd of July. Going to have symptoms for three months or more um, based on this these long COVID percentages. And this is clearly uh, a, a long-term morbidity problem. There's going to be a lot of people off work for a long time. And as well as that, the amount of people that are going to get pinged on the, on the tracker app and, and have to self-isolate is going to be huge. There could be a million, couple of million people have to self-isolate before the self-isolation rules are finished in August. So really quite significant impacts on the UK workforce, potentially over the next month or two between new cases of long COVID, not to mention the personal suffering, but all the number of people that have to self-isolate for 10 days prior to the change in the regulations in August. So that time between now and I think it's the 14th of August when self-isolation is not going to be required for double vaccinated people, I think. Positive people themselves will still have to um, self-isolate. But it, it, this is really could be a quite a, a dent on, on the UK workforce for a period of time. So anyway, that's quite concerning. So a thousand long COVID. So the numbers are accumulating. Last year, 180,000 people still had symptoms at three months. And as we know, a proportion of those still have symptoms much later. So this is a concern, the amount of long COVID. Now, Tim Spector gives advice on what to do after the 19th of July when these things become um, optional, optional in, in, uh, in England. Scotland are almost certainly going to carry on with mandatory mask uh, mandates and some social distancing measures. And in my view, sensibly so. Because wearing masks and some degree of social distancing can prevent an awful lot of spread. But... Um, as we as well as we've said, um, they don't cost very much, but this could be a herd immunity strategy that's never been declared. Uh, anyway, Tim Spector, um, so um, socialise outside or in well ventilated areas, of course. Uh, indoors, uh, shops, supermarkets, public transport, wear masks. Of course, carry on wearing masks. Keep your hands clean. Exercise common courtesy by wearing masks, and and I put respect there. You know, what one of the unsung heroes and heroines of this pandemic are supermarket workers i mean these people have carried on working all the time and basically the the impoliteness that i see towards supermarket workers i find appalling and i sometimes pick people up on it actually one thing that really gets on my nerves is um well obviously people not wearing masks people wearing masks below their noses which we might as well not bother the other thing that particularly annoys me is people going through the checkout on the mobile phones, talking to someone else as if this supermarket worker simply didn't exist. I just find it appalling. So people that work in supermarkets deserve respect. And that includes wearing masks and social distancing after the 19th of July. In my view, I feel that strongly. So this long COVID is going to be an ongoing uh, problem, unfortunately. Now, um, we're going to listen to um, uh, Valad Va Va now um, on um, his experience with um, chronic fatigue syndrome. And he sees similarities between chronic fatigue and long COVID. Now, um, 
he's had quite severe um, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, myalgic encephalopathy, uh, as it's sometimes called. I mean, although, to be fair, chronic fatigue syndrome can have so many different causes. So this is a fairly severe case, but I think it's really good to take this away from the t- statistics and change it to personal experience. So thank you. Let's listen to that now, I think. I think it up below. But John, if you're watching, I want to talk to you about long COVID and here is why. 17 years ago, I got sick with a condition that used to be called chronic fatigue syndrome. Now we spend more time calling it myalgic encephalomyelitis. It's a neuroimmune condition that can be very disabling. And even when it's moderate, it's significantly disabling. It stops people from working, makes them suffer a lot, makes them lose their income, makes uh, their relatives need to support them and so on. When I got sick 17 years ago, I was a postgrad student here in the UK. I was doing political um, philosophy at Oxford. And within a few weeks of getting sick, I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk, I couldn't read. I was not just physically, but cognitively debilitated. Luckily, my mental health remained good. And I was in a state like that for years. Um, It was years later that I began to read a sentence at a time, walk a step at a time. And I wasn't even as sick as the worst affected ME patients. Some of them need to be fed through a tube, um, need to be left alone in headphones with eye covers, Um, unable to tolerate light or human touch. In Britain alone, there are a quarter of a million people with ME. But why do I want to talk to um, John Campbell about this? Well, I want to talk to John about it because there is a connection between long COVID and ME. A great deal of long COVID is clearly not going to be ME, and there is no doubt about that. There are going to be folks who have had COVID in a very severe way, they may have been in hospital, and they might have end organ damage to recover from. There are then going to be people who have had COVID and just have some lingering challenges, lingering symptoms that they need to recover from. But there is going to be, and quite frankly, we already know that there is, a big group of folks um, who have gone on to develop ME, whose long COVID is either essentially ME or a condition very much like ME. Now, how do I know this? I know this because I am uh, privileged to be reasonably well medically connected. And so I talk to people in the research community and in the clinical community. We certainly know that um, Professor Nancy Klimas in the United States, who is a world leading expert, not just on ME, but on Gulf Gulf War syndrome, which we used to think was a psychological PTSD driven condition. But now we realize it's a a, a neurological uh, condition. Um, She believes that a, a, a big percentage of the long COVID patients will turn out to have ME. I do a regular diary. Uh, which I share on social media, in particular on Twitter, about life with ME. I've been doing this for over a year. Uh, during the course of this, of course, the pandemic happened. And I have got a great number of messages of folks who got COVID, then were labeled as having long COVID, and now clearly realize that they've got ME, they've got all of the symptoms of ME. We knew about this before the pandemic and um, as early as March and indeed February 2020, um, experts in the ME community and patients in the ME community were shouting from the rooftops about the potential for something like long COVID. Um, Even people with a much lower profile like myself released videos around March time pointing out that um, at least one significant study from the 1990s indicated a rate of ME uh, of as high as 10% when a series of viruses like uh, Ross River virus and Q fever passed through a particular town in Australia. I'm going to link that up below. So we know about this link um, from before this pandemic. 
we have ME experts clearly saying that much of COVID is, much of long COVID is ME. I um, get a lot of messages uh, from folks who realize that they have got ME after getting COVID. And the reason all of this is important is that it's in some parts of the world and over the last few days, particularly in the UK, we are looking at letting the virus go a little bit. We're looking at letting the virus spread. This is a government policy um, that I personally strongly disagree with, but we're not talking about politics now. And so if we let this virus go, we're simply going to have more cases and we're going to have more cases of long COVID. And Tony Komarov from Harvard, who is one of the most esteemed and conservatively spoken ME experts over the last few decades, here in Frontiers in Medicine, together with another ME expert, Lucinda Bateman, says recovering from COVID-19 doesn't guarantee a return to a person's usual state of health. For one thing, some people with multi-system injury, particularly to the brain, heart and kidneys, may develop permanent dysfunction of those organs. So this is the long COVID story that's nothing to do with ME. But they go on. In addition, a more subtle form of chronic illness may develop. For some people with COVID-19, even those who are only mildly affected at first, the ensuing weeks and months of recovery bring a surprise and a betrayal. They do not return to full health. And they go on to assess the possible rise in cases of ME globally and in the United States on the basis of the incomplete data they have. And they propose that if 10% of COVID patients go on to get ME, this would double the number of ME cases in the United States from just under a million to just under 2 million. And they say that that would be a remarkable event in the history of a chronic illness. So this is my ask um, of you, John. I know that um, you have um, discussed everything under the sun that pertains to people's experience of the pandemic in the most uh, responsible and educational way. And I would be grateful if you would consider uh, engaging further with the problem of long COVID. Now, that might mean that you um, engage with an expert, an international expert on ME, and that they come on your show and have a chat with you, and we could certainly arrange that. It might mean that you engage with a patient um, advocate or a patient communicator, and we could certainly find someone to do that um, too. I'd certainly be always open to speak to you, um, either on camera or off camera, um, to share certainly a, a patient's perspective of um, ME. And I think that this would be particularly valuable because we have got a, a deficit of quality information percolating through to the population about what long COVID entails and that one of the avenues of long COVID is something like the condition myalgic encephalomyelitis. Um, this has been a little more taxing on your patients, John, if you've managed to catch this message than I would have liked. I wanted to be briefer, but um, I'm going to thank you uh, uh, deeply for now and wish you all the best. Vlad, thanks for that very much. Um, well, I think Vlad said it all there, really. That's uh, what we need to know. Um, th th this is a risk, and with the UK experiment, this is going to be uh, is going to be a it's going to be it's going to be a risk, and it's um, yeah, not sure what to say, really. Vlad said it all there so well. So, Vlad, thank you for that. Um, uh, I really, really appreciate it when people are prepared to share the way that they have personally suffered uh, to try and help others. You know, I think it's a noble thing to do. So, so thank you. And uh, on that note, thank you for watching this particular video.